All right. Hey, good morning to you. It's um, uh, Thursday, right? Man, weeks fly, right? So I uh, hope you had a great night. I uh, hope everything's good in your world. Uh, it's going to be a good day and looking forward to everything in it. Got to hang out last night with my babe girl, who's 37 or so, uh, and all my grandkids and Tammy. And it was a great night just kind of hanging out and just enjoying each other's company. So it was good, ready to get ready to rock and roll today. Been up early, a little early, just studying and uh, here we are. So if you got your Bible, uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 3. We're going to look at two verses today. This is the baptism of Jesus, and uh, it's a significant event. Uh, it, it is the it what kicks off his ministry, so to speak. And I think we're going to learn a good bit of things today uh, about that. So this is one of those things that's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. And so I'm going to read... Um, I'm going to read it in all of them, and then we're going to come back to Luke, just so you're familiar with it. So you're, if you're in Luke, then you can you can look at that now. And if you want to look at the others, you can pause this and, and check that out. But uh, I'm going to read them all so we get a, a kind of a variation of a context so we can bring all those pieces together and help us make sense uh, and really learn some valuable things today. So here's what, uh, here's what Luke says. Now, when all the people were baptized, Jesus was also baptized. Now, what he's saying there, and all, there was a great amount of people that were being that were being baptized. It says all Jerusalem and all Judea in that sense. Not everyone who went out there were baptized. The Pharisees, some of them weren't. Scriptures say that, but uh, they had rejected that. <coughs> but uh, what he's saying is, when everybody's coming out, so did Jesus. This is what Jesus didn't have some private baptism or some personal baptism in that sense that was you know outside the norm. He was among the people. So it says, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Now, that's how Luke describes it. Matthew says it like this. Uh, then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have the need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me. So he's coming out in the water, and John's like, uh-uh, time out. This is, no, I, I need to be baptized by you, yet you're coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, allow it at this time. It's great, great humility, right? Allow it at this time. He recognized that he was the prophet of God. And so Jesus, being in human form, is really not necessarily seeking permission, but you can see there's this humble attitude where he says, allow it at this time, for in this way, it is for it is fitting for us, you and me, to fulfill all righteousness, that you're doing what God has called you to do, and I'm going to submit and be a part of that, because it was essential that, that the Messiah be righteous, and since that was what God required, that is to to repent and to be he didn't need repentance but the baptism aspect of it to do that he listen he went to the passover services and all of that right he didn't have need of any of that but he grew up doing that so uh he says allow it at this time for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness then he allowed him after he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and the Spirit of God descending as a dove and setting on him. And behold, a voice from the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And then Mark says it like this. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan, and immediately came out of the water. He saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came from the heavens. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well satisfied, well pleased. And immediately the spirit brought him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness. So that tells you what happened there. Then John says it like this. The next day he saw, he's baptizing. It says in the next day, he saw Jesus coming to him and said, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he in behalf of whom I said, After me is coming a man who has proved to be my superior, because he existed before me. And I did not recognize him, but so that he would be revealed to Israel, I came baptizing with water. John said, I came because I knew out of the, the villages and out of the area, the Messiah would show up. 
because he's righteous, because he's going to come and fulfill all righteousness. And so he said the re he will be revealed at this baptism. He said, so I, I, <clears throat> he said, I didn't recognize him, but so that he would be revealed, I came baptizing in water. And John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water, that lets us know that he, that, that John didn't just make this baptism up. He who sent me is none other than God himself. God himself sent me to baptize in water and said to me, he upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So that's why G, that's why John is like, hey, I'm and they're they're talking about baptism, and he says, Man, are you the Messiah? He goes, No, no, no. I'm here waiting to reveal, have the have the Messiah revealed to me and to you. Uh, and when he comes, he's going to baptize in you in the Holy Spirit, not just water. And so this is why you see all of these pieces coming together. And he says, and I myself have seen and have testified that this is God. And I have seen him and I have testified to you. I witnessed exactly what God said would happen. And that I saw the spirit descending on me as a dove. I know for a fact that he's the Messiah. Now, that's how all of the, the uh, writers of the gospels have spoken. So let's kind of go back, recreate this story. Just let me walk through you kind of in a narrative fashion so we can kind of feel it and experience it as we go through this and we'll get on our day. So 30 years have have come and Jesus has lived really in obscurity. There, there's th This is the second statement that, that we will have heard him make. Um, and, and so the first one was when he was 12 years old, right? He, he, you hear him speak. Then you hear him speak at this baptism, the, the, the encounter that he had with John. Hey, listen, I have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. And so he has traveled from Nazareth to Galilee. So Nazareth is north of the Galilean region, and he's traveled to Galilee. Uh, if you look at it on a map, it's about a 70-mile journey kind of a thing. So he's traveled 70 miles, kind of out of obscurity. Nobody knows him. The only com uh, comment we have on on him is that when he was 12, they found him in the temple because he stayed behind. And, and so whoever was in that caravan, or whatever, however that story emanated from Mary and, and Joseph, uh, that <clears throat> that's how that, that would have been told. But Jesus is just simply a, a carpenter living in obscurity in Nazareth. He's, he's a small town boy, uh, grown up to be a man, but he's done no miracles, done nothing, just lived a quiet, humble life, working with his hands, sinless, perfect attitude, perfect thoughts, perfect behavior. And so he comes down now to the waters, and if he's standing there, and he's standing among the crowd, that's what it said, right? Uh, that that he was uh, uh, he was just standing with the crowd, and they're being baptized. So if there's a line, maybe they're all standing on the on the Jordan River, you know, kind of the banks, and there's a there's like a line that goes in. You know how everybody forms a line, and sometimes it's not perfect, but everybody knows who's in front of who as they're standing in line. If you've ever been to any place, you see that. And so he's in line and he's waiting and John's out there baptizing. And as he's doing that, people are coming out. They're confessing their sins. Could be that John's baptizing two at a time, right? Um, but, but they're doing their thing. They are crying out for forgiveness or confessing their sins that they might be forgiven. And they are preparing their hearts for the Lord to come, the Messiah to come, who then will uh, will baptize them in, in the Holy Spirit in that sense. And so that that's what's going on. So they're cousins from different regions. The, the scripture earlier said that, right, John didn't recognize him. Uh, you know, so they're, I mean, potentially it means that he didn't, they didn't, he, he, knew, he knew his cousin was a Messiah. I'm sure his mom had told him that because she heard that from the angel. I'm sure John grew up knowing that. He knew who he was. So it's not like he didn't know the Messiah, uh, that Jesus was going to be the Messiah, because I'm, there's just a great assumption with great uh, weight of that, that that's what's going on. So what this means he didn't recognize him is that, like cousins are, they just 30 years have gone by, and, uh, you know, how, how often do they see each other? They're, they're, they're you know, days apart. Uh, how much did they travel to see each other? Probably not that much. So it's possible he's just like, I'm not, I, I don't know, I haven't, I don't I can't recognize my cousin, 
right? So their paths didn't cross much. But here, stepping into the water now, with those coming out and those behind him waiting to come in, is the Messiah. He's stepping into that Jordan River, the same Jordan River that was parted with Joshua when, when the priest stood in the waters and it parted. Uh, it's the same Jordan that we read constantly throughout the scriptures. So here is Yeshua. This is Savior. This is Emmanuel. That's the name that was given to him. God with us. This is the Savior of the world, the God who is with us, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the King of Kings, standing in line to be baptized. Nobody even knows it. And so then... Those ahead, or they're doing all their confession and all of that. Matthew says there's huge crowds, all of Judea, all of Jerusalem, and uh, and all of the uh, the districts around Jordan have come out. So it's a huge crowd out there, and out he comes into the water. All of this is to prepare for the coming Messiah. That's the whole point of everything that's going on. Now the Messiah is standing among them. He's now in the water, and John, according to Matthew, says, "Ah, oh, man, woo." Uh, uh, so now he recognizes John, <clears throat> and he's like, oh, man, uh, I, I have need of being baptized by you. You, th we, we can't do it this way. We just read that earlier, right? Jesus says, hey, allow it at this time that you and me may fulfill all righteousness, that you do your part, I'm doing my part. I'm coming to the waters because it's to be obedient to everything God requires of his people, and I'm one of his people encased in this flesh, and so I am coming to fulfill the obligation of doing that which God requires. And this is a piece of it. And John, you're baptizing me because God has called you to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so he says, allow this, right? So God was requiring his people to be baptized, so John's baptized. John was baptizing them so that the Messiah would be revealed. That's what John said, right? He's out there baptizing. Why? Because at some point the Messiah is going to come and he's going to baptize him. And, he, and when he sees the dove of the Holy Spirit settle on him, he'll know that's the Messiah. And the whole world will know that as well. So now God told John that that's how it would be confirmed, right? So we've looked at that. So here we are. Jesus wasn't in need of confessing sin because he had no sins to confess, right? We, we know that. So he was just fulfilling righteousness. His This is cool. His righteous life, this part right here, his baptism was like you and me being baptized, right? Because his righteousness is now credited to us as righteousness. So he fulfilled the whole law. He was baptized in my place in the Jordan River. He walked through uh, the land of, of Israel, and he fulfilled every law the Lord required. He tied the right amount. He did everything that was supposed to be done, he did, just as though I did it. So when I, you and me, are, are repent of our sins, confess our sins, are baptized because of the forgiveness of our sins, we receive the Holy Spirit, we have been transferred, all that was me was buried, all that is him is raised to, to new life, so that now his righteousness is now my righteousness. That's the gospel. I'm not earning anything. It was credited to me as righteous. Everything he did, this baptism all the way to the crucifixion, he fulfilled the righteous acts of God, and he satisfied the wrath of God by dying on the cross for you and me. His resurrection meant that the game was over. Uh, death no longer has a victory. The curse has been reversed in that sense to all who have embraced the gospel. And so what happens now is when God sees me, he sees the righteousness of Christ. That's all he sees. This is what this, So this is the beginning of Jesus fulfilling all righteousness. <coughs> now, then we come to this. Now, this is an undeniable piece of theology that I don't intend to explain because it sounds silly when you're trying to explain it. You either just accept it or you try to weasel your way out of it. And you have theologies that are built around it where, where uh, they, it's something called modalism, where God just kind of transfers himself, you know, between deals. Uh, so he just, you know, he invades this and then he looks like this and then he looks like this. <clears throat> but when they all converge and you see all three distinct in different forms and places, you have to acknowledge that 
there's one God that subsists in three personalities, right? And so there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's where we get the Trinity. We can act like, well, it's not that big a deal. Well, it's a big deal because this is how God describes it. Because he says, that, behold, the Lord thy God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God. That means that there is complete unity among these three. Each has a role, and, and they're played out in life. And so this is the Trinity. You can act like it doesn't exist, and you do it to your own demise, right? I'm just telling you exactly what happened. So let's look at it. It says, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form. So here is God, Emmanuel, the Son of God, <clears throat> standing in the waters. He's there. Then God, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is descending in a in bodily form, Luke says, in bod not not a human body, but in the body that looked like a dove, from like a dove. It, it wasn't, but it looked like it. And every one of the gospel writers says it was like a dove, right? <clears throat> so here is the Holy Spirit descending. Now, when you and I were baptized, we didn't see anything. We had a non-experiential baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? So when you and I came to Christ, the Spirit of God resided within us. He came and dwelt among us, in me. Jeremiah says that's the, that that is the uh, new covenant, that God would put his Spirit within us. And so at salvation, we get that. He is, the Spirit of Christ is put in us. So, <clears throat> this is Jesus, Son of God. This is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, coming and taking up residence inside God in the form of man named Jesus. So, you have those two distinct coming together, and then you have this. <clears throat> and a voice came from heaven. Well, now, it didn't come from Jesus. It didn't come from the Spirit, because now they're, 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 he was, they're there, right? From heaven, a voice, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Visible, audible, people hear it, right? John saw the dove. Everybody could see that thing, uh, the Holy Spirit. I shouldn't call it a thing. The Holy Spirit, that animal that, was, that, that he had taken the form of, was descending, a bird, descending on him. And so you have that, and then you have the voice in heaven announcing to all of those in that wilderness, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That is the Trinity. That's the power, all that came together, all of that work, <clears throat> because God so loved the world that he sent his Son, right? That whoever believes in him should not perish. Perish from what? What does that mean? To, to die? Yeah. But also perish in, in, in the internal fires, right? There is that. We like that. Some like to act like that's not so, but it is so. And, and so because God so loved the world, God the Son took the form of human flesh to walk among us perfectly, living life empowered by the Holy Spirit that was given to him as a foretaste of what would happen to us. And God is well pleased with this one act. Why? Because Jesus is going to save you and me from our sins. God so loved the world that he had to create a way because our sins had made a separation from us and God. And there was no bridging that gap. The law couldn't do it. It had already proven it couldn't. All it did was show us that we're sinners in need of of a savior. And this is that moment when that takes place. And and so this is this is God's love being displayed for the whole world to know. That's our message. That's the hope of the world. And that's the good news I bring to you this morning. So have a great day and uh, man Lord willing we're going to jump into more of this Monday.